kind of rabid soccer fan who turned several heads when he found a way around the rules that were preventing him from enjoying rooting for his favorite team. Now, his name is Ali, although most people call him Crazy Ali, because he really is a rabid soccer fan. Anybody here know a rabid sports fan of some kind? You all can raise your hands because you know me, right? Um, well, he's a rabid soccer fan when it comes to his team, at least. You see, he'd been banned. <clears throat> banned from his team stadium for a year because of what he calls an incident. An incident between him and some fans for the other team. The incident led to him being charged with a misdemeanor level crime. And so he was banned from the stadium for a year. But he wasn't going to be deterred. You see, they had a really important game coming up, kind of like the Ohio State-Michigan game, right? It was against their arch rival, and he found a workaround to his problem. You see, he rented one of those high-low forklifts, the really big ones that builders use to lift stuff way up into a building. And it, he rented one that was high enough to lift him up so that he could see over the stadium wall. So he was later interviewed by the local newspaper because obviously it drew attention. He said, this match was very important for our team. I had to go, but I had to go to the police station first to sign a paper to show that I'm not at the stadium, right? He had to prove he wasn't in the stadium so, that, so every time they had a game, he had to go to the police station, sign a paper saying I'm not at the game. So he went and signed the paper and then he went and picked up his forklift. Social media in the area was full of pictures of a jubilant Ali cheering from his perch high above the stadium. Ultimately, the police were summoned and he was forced to lower his crane. He did, however, end the day on a high note. Uh, the stunt only cost him the $86 that uh, cost him to rent it. He wasn't cited or fined by the authorities and his team won five to nothing. But you got to admire that kind of tenacity and commitment, don't you? Well, pastor and author Chuck Swindoll says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important sometimes than facts. It's more important than the past. It's more important than your education. It's more important than money or circumstances or failures or successes. It's more important than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, even a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we embrace for that day. We can't change our past. We can't change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We can't change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Now, he's not talking about the power of positive thinking or choosing to be happy every day. Because sometimes bad things happen and happiness depends on happenings. We can't be happy every day. I mean, two thirds of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. David and the other psalmists knew how to praise God, but they also knew how to sing the blues. Life is full of ups and downs. I'm not suggesting that we can choose happiness every day because we can't. We're not built that way. But we can choose tenacity and commitment and resilience. Right now we're walking through Mark's gospel together. We're looking closely at the life and mission of Jesus. And we're encountering Jesus together in the pages of Scripture. Today we're going to encounter in the pages of Scripture, in Mark chapter 2, we're going to encounter three different mindsets. Turn with me to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. 
And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together at the home, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who indeed, right? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, and said to him, he said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise. Pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. The human mind is a powerful thing. But it's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? If I asked you where your mind is, you'd probably point to your head, right? But if I ask you what's the difference between your mind and your brain, what would you say? And sometimes your mind is anywhere but in your head. Your mind is your ability to think and feel and do things, choose to do things. It's your, your thinking and your feeling and your will. Your brain is this organic thing inside you that enables those things to happen. You know, I often tell people with, who, who deal with severe anxiety that we need to put your mind back inside your head. Because when we're really anxious, our minds are somewhere else. Our minds are on something that might happen that we're worried about, or they're ruminating about something that's already happened that we can't change. So that's one, why one of the first things we do with a really anxious person is ground them in the moment in their bodies. We have them pay attention to what's going on right now around them and inside them. We kind of try to put their mind back inside their head from wherever it's wandered off to. But every mind has a mind set. A person's mindset is it's kind of a fixed thing. It's, it's hard to change your mindset. It can change, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of discipline. Your mindset, or sometimes we say your frame of mind, it, it, that includes your beliefs, your preconceptions, your biases, and your values. And many of those things are influenced by our experiences in life. And when C.S. Lewis made the decision to follow Christ, he was changing from the mindset of an atheist who had been schooled and trained to logically refute Christianity. He had been, been identified at a very young age as having a brilliant mind, and he had uh, this incredible education where his tutors and his mentors were specifically trying to shape this brilliant mind to be able to actually refute Christianity. And what happened is, as he began to apply what they taught him, he realized that Christianity is the truth, that Jesus really is the Son of God. He reasoned himself into the kingdom of God, so to speak. And that's a heck of a mindset change, isn't it? To go from being trained and steeped in academic atheism to following Jesus. But it was in his training in logic and philosophy and literature, which was designed to make him a force against Christianity, actually led him to become a follower of Jesus and one of the greatest apologists for the faith, defenders of the faith that the church has ever known. 
His small book, Mere Christianity, is a brilliant defense of the Christian faith. That wasn't a small change or a subtle change. It was a radical change in his mindset, in his frame of mind. And that change, we often think of it as a transformation, radically transformed the way he taught and the way he wrote and the topics he chose to write about. He was a prolific author. And the way he lived and loved. That was a real change in mindset brought about by his faith in Jesus. So our mindsets tend to be pretty fixed, but Jesus can transform them, and he does. Well, the first frame of mind we encounter in this passage is the frame of mind of the paralyzed man's friends. Look at verses 2 through 4. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. So Jesus is back in Capernaum. He's staying in someone's home. Maybe it was Peter and Andrew's home. We don't know. But we do know that people were now flocking to see and hear Jesus. Remember that immediately before this, Jesus had had touched and healed a leper. And and because of that, word about Jesus was spreading around the countryside. And so people were flocking to him so that maybe, hopefully, he could touch and heal them so that they could hear him speak. And there were so many people coming to see him and to hear him that Mark tells us the house was packed. And there were likely people crowding around the outside too. There was no longer no one in a room even in the doorway. I mean, the house was packed full of people. But there are four men in, in the village, in the town of Capernaum, who have a friend who's paralyzed. We don't know why he was paralyzed. We don't know how, for how long he had been paralyzed. Maybe he was born that way. Maybe he was injured at some point and lost the use of at least his legs. What we know for sure is that he couldn't walk, so he laid on a mat. And his friends have heard about Jesus, and they decide they have to get their friend to him. And so they each pick up a corner of the mat on which he's laying, and off they go to the house where Jesus is staying. And it isn't hard to find because it's the house where everybody in the village is gathered hearing him speak. But there are so many people there that they can't get inside. They can't get their friend close to Jesus. And that's when we get to see their frame of mind, their mindset. Because they didn't pout. They didn't get discouraged. They didn't get frustrated or angry. They got creative. Their goal was to bring their friend to Jesus so that he could get help. And undeterred by apparent obstacles, they found a way. Now, most houses in that region, they had flat roofs that kind of doubled, could double as outdoor living space. And and, and the roofs had to be redone every year because they were thatched. And so there were stairs going up the side of the house so that people could get up there to do the work. And so up the men went, doing a little math as they climbed so that they knew where exactly Jesus was standing beneath the roof. Like I said, it was a thatched roof, and most people redid their roofs, or at least refurbished them once a year anyway. They made a hole in the roof. And having found some rope or some vine somewhere, they lowered him down through the roof and the ceiling. Think about the work that they had to do when they encountered these obstacles. They had to figure out, they could either turn around and go home and say, well, I guess it's not going to work. God must not want to heal him. We often say when God closes a door, he opens a window. Sometimes I think when the door's closed, we've got to make a hole in the roof. So then they, looking around, they're like, well, what are we going to do? And they spy the stairs going up, and somebody, one of them gets an idea, says, let's go up there. So up the roof they go, lugging their friend with them. And when they get up there, they do the work to make an opening. Then they have to find some rope or some vine or something, something to tie onto the four corners so that they can lower him down. 
And then they have to do the work of carefully lowering their friend down, not too fast, or he's going to need prayer for some other things. Everyone needs a friend like that. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be friends like that. Friends determined to let those we love see Jesus. A friend who doesn't quit when the going gets tough and there are too many obstacles in the way. They could have turned around and went back home and said, well, I guess it's not going to work. You know, it's like when you get up and you look out the window and you open the door and it's doing what it was doing yesterday. If that were today, how many of us would have closed the door and said, I'm going back to bed. I'm not going to church today. I mean, I could have done that too, right? And then Greg would be here panicking. <laughs> He's supposed to always have a sermon in his hip pocket just in case. But they didn't let obstacles get in the way. And they didn't look for the path of least resistance, assuming that that's where God was guiding them. They made a way where there wasn't a way to bring their friend to Jesus. They were resilient and they were persistent. Stephen Mansfield tells the true story about a church that had this incredible ministry to men. For years, the driving force behind that men's ministry was a man named Taylor. His ministry rocked on for many, many years. It changed lives. It impacted the community. But as sadly is often the case, that church went through some leadership transitions and in the process of that, Taylor got hurt deeply. And so he left the church. He wouldn't talk to anybody in the church. People figured he'd come back eventually, but he didn't. So finally, some of the men in the church took it upon themselves to reach out to him. And after some discussion with the other guys at the church, they came up with a really bold plan. They would set up camp in his yard. 150 men. So they set up rotating shifts. And they decided they wouldn't leave until Taylor came out. They had electric lines running from neighbors' houses to power their televisions. They had about 20 smokers and grills. Had some great barbecue food. All of this going on in Taylor's yard. They were there for the long haul. They even had big signs all over the place out there. Taylor, come out. We love you. Taylor, we know you're in there. Well, Taylor <laughs> didn't appreciate this. He even called the police on his former friends. As a matter of fact, the police showed up twice a day for almost a week. And every time they came, Taylor would come to the door to explain the situation. And every time the men camping in, in his yard when they saw him in the door talking to the police officers, they would explode with cheers until Taylor finished his chat with the police and went back inside. But on the sixth day, six days of this, when Taylor opened the door for the police and the men exploded with cheers, he finally broke down and started crying. He sputtered how sorry he was, and then he came out from his porch and greeted the guys who had camped in his yard and refused to go away. That is the power of committed, persistent friendship. Creative, persistent, and kind. That's the mindset of a godly friend. That's the mindset of this man's friend. We're bringing our friend to Jesus. Even if we have to make a hole in the roof. Now look at verses 1 and 2. 
And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Jesus is preaching a sermon. He's teaching the people. Mark says that he was preaching the word to them. What was, what was that word? Well, if you look back at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15... Mark tells us what Jesus preached, what he spoke. He said, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what Jesus preached. That was his message. He's preaching the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. He's preaching repentance and the forgiveness of sin. And then as he's preaching, some dirt starts to fall from the ceiling. And pretty soon, shafts of light break through as the tiny hole the men on the roof make gets larger and larger. And then there's this man on a mat being lowered into the house from above. Now, we all expect something to happen. We all expect Jesus to heal the man, right? I mean, this guy's obviously, he can't walk. He's laying on his mat. Everybody knows what that mat is. It's his bed. They're lowering him in from the roof on a human crane. Everybody expects Jesus to heal him, but that isn't what he does, at least not at first. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Do you imagine being the four dudes on the roof? All that work to get your friend in front of Jesus so that Jesus could heal him. And your friend is laying there on the ground in front of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, son, your sins are forgiven. Oh, Jesus, that's great. But what he really needs is to be able to walk. Is that what he really needs? I mean, you've heard about Jesus. You know that his teaching is new and powerful and has authority, but he also heals people. He touched and healed that leper. Our friend isn't a leper. You can touch him without being made unclean. I mean, remember, leprosy, you might as well have raised someone from the dead. Jesus drove out demons. Maybe, possibly, he would heal your friend too. And so you carry your paralyzed buddy across town, but you can't get anywhere near the door. There are so many people. And then you spot it, the stairwell going up the side of the house to the roof, and you point to it, and off you go, carrying your friend on his mat up the stairs, and then having decided where to make the hole, you start working through, you know, working your way through the mud and palm leaves and sticks that make up this thatched roof, and then you lower your friend down through the hole, and he's laying on this mat on the ground right in front of this powerful teacher and miracle worker, and when the teacher speaks, what's he say? Son, your sins are forgiven. That's great, Jesus, but that isn't why we did all of this. We did it so that he can be healed, so that he can walk. I mean, yeah, forgiveness, I get it. We all need it. But what we really want is for our friend to walk. Because we miss the miracle that is forgiveness. We so take it for granted that for us, the big miracle is the guy walking out of the house. And we miss the miracle of forgiveness. But what's Jesus' mindset here? What's his frame of mind? What's he focused on? The forgiveness of sin. The kingdom of God. Restored relationship with God. He never loses sight of the kingdom of God. He knows the difference between our felt needs and our deepest needs. Our felt needs, our pain and suffering in this world are very important. They're real and they matter. But our deepest need, our, our need for forgiveness for the sin that taints every human heart, that is of utmost importance. Our felt need versus our deepest need. That which is very important versus that which is of utmost importance. Felt needs matter. Forgiveness matters most. 
And that's what Jesus focuses on first. But he remembers the felt need to. But before we turn to that, we need to look at the third mindset in this passage, the mindset of the scribes. Look at verses 6 and 7. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Scribes were men schooled in the written law of God in its oral interpretation. They weren't rabbis. They were a step below rabbis. They functioned below them. And they taught the people what the Word of God said and how the different rabbis interpreted the Word of God and how they applied it to daily life. They were a closed order of legal specialists. They were highly educated, though, in their own right. New scribes were admitted to this closed order. You couldn't just say, I'm a scribe now. You had to be admitted to the group. And they were admitted only when they were deemed fully qualified by other scribes and rabbis, and they were set apart for their work through the laying on of hands in prayer. It was a highly respected position in the community. And obviously, word about Jesus had been getting around, and evidently some of the scribes decided they needed to see this new phenomenon, this new rabbi for themselves, and so several found themselves in the crowd in the house that day. The teaching was new and interesting, but when the man was lowered down from the roof, well, that's in their eyes where things really went off the rails. Why? Because only God could forgive sin. And Jesus had just claimed to forgive this paralytic sin, and that's blasphemy. You see, in their mindset, sin, uh, illness and injury were the result of sin. And so clearly this man or someone close to him had done something wrong that resulted in this man's paralysis. It was kind of the secret sin being made public. Now we're just starting the second chapter of Mark, right? And Jesus has already challenged the expectations of his cousin, John the Baptist, his first followers, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He's challenged the assumptions of the men who lowered their friend through the hole in the roof. And now he's challenged the assumptions of the scribes. These were men who studied and taught the word of God as a profession. They knew the law of Moses. They knew the writings of David and the other psalmists. They knew the prophets. They knew it all. You, you, come into, you don't come into this career unless you have all of that down and actually memorized. They knew all of it, but they didn't. And when Jesus didn't fit into their box, they rejected him. Jesus consistently refuses to fit into our boxes. He consistently refuses to meet our expectations of him. Frame of mind is hard to overcome. We have to be willing to let Jesus challenge our biases and our assumptions and the way we've always thought about things. The mindset of the friends, creative determination and faith that Jesus could and would heal their friend. The mindset of Jesus felt needs are important, but nothing is more important than the forgiveness of sins in the kingdom of God. And he never loses sight of that. The mindset of the scribes, dry orthodoxy. But Jesus is going to use their assumptions against them. You see, he's paying attention and he knows what they're thinking. Look at verse 8. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paramedic, paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? What's Jesus saying? It's harder to forgive sins than it is to heal paralysis. Forgiveness of sin requires death. His death. Forgiveness of sin requires the cross. That's hard. Saying to this guy, get up and walk. I can do that without lifting a finger. But they're thinking this guy is this way because he has sinned.
But so that you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Their assumption, he can't be healed until the sins are forgiven. Forgiven. Jesus says, okay. Get up and walk. There's your evidence. He's walking out the door. Yeah, his sins are forgiven. Jesus deals with the deeper need first. He forgives. And that is all the man needs. But he also has compassion on the felt need, and he uses it to teach the scribes a lesson. And so he heals. And the man walks out of their hole. And the whole crowd, scribes included, are astonished. Mindsets have been challenged. And they're changing. Like I said, people in that day viewed injury and illness as being the result of sin. And it really is. But there isn't always a one-to-one correlation between a specific sin and a specific illness. Illness or bad things happening aren't always the direct result of one person's sin. But sin in general, brokenness in this world, yeah. That also leads to illness and injury and bad things happening. But in that day, someone dealing with a terrible sickness or injury in their minds clearly deserved it. And even, so even as Jesus heals, the focus is on the forgiveness of his sin. Not because he necessarily had a specific sin that he'd committed that caused him to be paralyzed, but so that Jesus could prove that I have the authority to forgive sins. And my healing is proof of that. Healing is the presence in history of the promise of history. The promise of the kingdom of God, a world and a people fully forgiven, healed, and restored. But let us never think that physical wholeness in this world is the essence of faith, because it's not. St. Paul had his own physical ailment. He called it a thorn in his flesh. I always picture it being right here, but I don't know what kind of thorn in the flesh he had. He begged God to heal him of it. Just like Jesus had healed this paralytic of his ailment. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, 9 says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes God does choose to heal miraculously. Sometimes God chooses to give us strength, though, to carry the burden. But God always forgives those who ask Him. And sometimes, as in the case of the paralyzed man, even those who don't, He will always forgive. Have you ever seen those lost pet signs people staple to trees and power poles and stuff? Well, there was once one that offered a big cash reward for whoever found the lost dog and the description of the dog was on it. It said, he's only got three legs. He's blind in the left eye. He's missing a right ear. His tail has been broken off. He was neutered accidentally by a fence. Think about that for a minute. He's almost deaf. And he answers to the name Lucky. (laughs) That dog isn't Lucky. He's been through a whole lot of mess. But he is Lucky. Because he's got an owner who loves him and wants him back. That's what redemption is all about. That's what Jesus is all about. That's the mindset of the kingdom of God and those of us who live in that kingdom. That's what life in the kingdom of God is all about. Let us pray. Great God, we thank you for those times when you heal. Sometimes it's miraculously, sometimes it's through the work of healers, doctors, and nurses. But we know, Lord, there's times when you don't. And it's in those times that you give us the strength when you tell us, my grace is sufficient for you. I need you to carry this. We don't always understand why. But we do thank you. That while sometimes our felt needs are met and sometimes they're not, our deepest need always is. And that's the need for forgiveness. 
So we thank you for your forgiveness this morning. In Christ's name we pray.